everybody. My name is Scott Hebbard from Spark Systems and the webinar we're presenting is called Modeling the NATO Architecture Framework with Enterprise Architect. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to host and uh, present this topic for you all. I'm joined by uh, Christian, Beat and Peter who will be doing the presenting and I'm really looking forward to their contribution. Uh, the brief agenda, we're going to uh, look at how to submit questions in GoTo. I'm then going to hand over to Christian that's going to start this uh, discussion and presentation. And uh, then we'll hear from uh, Beat and Peter and uh, we'll finish up with Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, please note, um, all audio is muted for participants. Uh, you'll be able to type questions to the host and they'll come through to me. And uh, if we can't answer all of our um, your questions live, we'll follow up offline. So um, um, please note, if uh, you do miss anything, we'll make this uh, recording available on the Spark Systems YouTube site and also on the Spark Systems site. And uh, also just a note that we've released uh, the Enterprise Architect 15.2 beta and the Pro Cloud Server beta and we also have ProLaborate available. And uh, feel free to reach out to Peter or Spark Systems if you want any more information on our range of products. Uh, so you should see a question box like this. You can simply uh, type question and hit send and uh, or hit enter on the numeric keypad and that'll come through to us. Here uh, it's hosting and uh, we'll be able to ask the appropriate panel member the question and get some answers to you. But right now, I'd like to hand over to Christian, who's going to present on uh, the NATO architecture framework. So I'll just uh, make you the presenter. And uh, Christian, it's great to have you online. And I'll let you know when I can uh, see your screen. So uh, thank you very much. I can see your presentation is up online. So if you just uh, unmute your mic and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are joining us. Um, just at first a short introduction of uh, ourselves. Um, um, me, this is uh, Christian Freyhoff. I'm uh, from Germany and I'm working for the German Procurement Office or the Armament Office, you name it. Uh, as you see, the official name is a bit longer. I won't read it down here. <laughs> you can read it by yourself. Um, I am I'm an IT architect and uh, currently I'm working for the system architect of the IT system Bundeswehr. Um, my domain and expertise is in frameworks. That means the NATO architecture framework and uh, it's a German extension um, in the uh, NATO's architecture capability team, which is an owner of the NATO architecture framework. I'm responsible for the maintenance of uh, the NAF itself, and I'm also the administrator of the German extension or German version of the NAF. Um, I'm also carrying about architecture training in uh, NATO and in Germany, and I'm uh, concerned with uh, architecture toolings uh, as we are just here um, with Sparks and Press Architect extensions to this and analysis tools and so on. And my colleague is Beard Lang. I think he will introduce himself now. Yes, thank you, Christian. My name is Beard Lang. I work for the command support organization of the Swiss Armed Forces and I'm subject matter expert on the EA uh, methodology and tools. Uh, I'm, I'm responsible for the um, Swiss spe specific uh, extension work and development work, uh, especially regarding this uh, NEF uh, v4 profile and MDG and, and our uh, extensions uh, around the, the modeling tool Sparks Enterprise Architect. I'm also a member of um, the uh, ACAT, uh, the capability, NATO architecture capability team. And, and there I 
support Christian uh, with the uh, development, uh, with the ongoing development of the NEF v4 uh, uh, framework and the tool support. Back to okay. you, Christian. Yeah, thank you, Bert. Um, I'll continue. Yes, sir. a short agenda. Uh, what do you want to uh, what do you, we want to tell you about today? Um, I will jump in uh, talking about NATO and enterprise architecture. Why does NATO need and use architecture enterprise architecture as a defense organization? Um, what is uh, something about the NATO architecture framework version four now? Uh, the use of the unified architecture framework or its meta model in NAV four. Why is that so? Um, and um, the central product for this webinar, the brand new NAV4 profiles for Sparks Enterprise Architect. Uh, and the following then, uh, Beard will jump in and show a uh, Sparks EA made repatriation scenario or parts of it modeled with NAV4. And uh, at the end, we will have a discussion and of course uh, talk about the availability of these profiles. Um, okay. NATO and enterprise architecture. Um, this is a very good slide. I borrowed it from a British colleague, and uh, I think it's uh, very self-explaining our our problems we have today as uh, military organizations and missions and so on. Uh, you see several statements, and in every statement you have the thing with the information availability of information. Um, and this is the thing uh, today. Uh, our main problems are not uh, some uh, some rivals not shooting or helicopters not flying. Okay, sometimes in Germany still is a problem, but uh, usually our problem is the availability of information. Uh, information is the lifeblood of operations, of missions, and also of all our core processes. And that makes it necessary to somehow architect. <clears throat> and on the other hand, NATO is, in fact, a kind of an enterprise, huh? and so needs some enterprise architecture. Indeed, we have a the smallest core of NATO, the smallest organizational core of NATO is here. You see the NATO enterprise. It's that's the actual name of this part here: the NATO command structure, the headquarters, and the agencies. Huh? And the next step is the alliance uh, including the nato nations and the force structure and also the biggest composition is uh, the coalition or federation including also partner nations and other organizations like the european union or non-governmental organizations so you see here very well uh, that nato is somehow also structured like an enterprise uh, and so should be somehow architected like an enterprise. <clears throat> well, the of uh, <clears throat> NATO enterprise architecture uh, shall be regarding our principles or vision strategy uh, is at first to really translate uh, our vision and strategy into really effective changes that means we want to come from planning to doing uh, we want to somehow support or accompany uh, migrations to desired future states student programs or projects uh, we want to have our development or interoperability this is a very big word in nato very important um, we want that to be supported effective and efficient uh, interoperability just for the people out of the uh, defense context interoperability means somehow that i am able uh, to call up a comrade from for example the united states with a german radio on his uh, un made in usa radio and we can talk to each other using the same waveform for example uh, this is something we need architecting for. Um, we want to reuse our capabilities. Uh, our capabilities, our capability is the ability to do something, to achieve some effect. Uh, and uh, without having them um, properly architected, 
we would not really be able to this reusage and we would implement capabilities again and again and have then duplicates and much more costs. Uh -huh. And at the end, of course, uh, governance and management of all these activities at all levels, uh, for example, enterprise and project levels, um, is an important thing we want to achieve with using enterprise architecture. And that does not only mean NATO or NATO itself as an organization, that does also mean the NATO nations themselves. Uh, for example, in Germany also, we uh, have exactly the same objectives we want to achieve using architecture. Here, something e bit easier to explain what I mean. We have uh, our business or business cases, and we have um, we have resources uh, to conduct this uh, business cases. Uh, while the business somehow drives the resources, uh, the resources do enable the business, uh, and on one level or each level, for example. On our business level, we have using architecture, using logical views, for example, that means, for example, processes and so on, uh, to steer and to control our business level here. We're using physical viewpoints, uh, for example, in procurement of resources, uh, in development of resources, um, to control and to steer that development. But we are also using the exchange of information between these views um, to reach our business and resource alignment. Uh, for example, a business case could be here, uh, our soldiers somewhere in the woods in, in, in winter, snowy, huh? and uh, their process, the process tells us they want to move more faster than with their skis. and. Uh, that would somehow drive the development of such a vehicle, uh, which is able to, uh, to drive through, uh, through a deep snow and so on. And this is the thing that the architecting and the NATO architecture framework is our tool, not only to steer different or control different layers in the enterprise, but also to have some layer piercing tool to uh, for development and for our business resource alignment. Um, NATO itself is uh, doing an architecture a long time here. Just the last recent dates where some things have been created or published. Um, uh, last uh, bigger document was the NATO architecture framework version 4. We come to that uh, in a few seconds. Uh, or a new Alliance C3 strategy, which does also contain uh, strategic concerns about architecting. And if we would go that timeline back, uh, we would come to the publication of the NATO architecture framework version 3 in 2007. Uh, and that tells us that NATO and also the NATO nations are doing in architecting for several years now. The architecture framework version 2, I just told you that uh, the version 3 is from 2007. Um, and of course, after several years, um, it's somehow necessary to to, to do some improvements and to learn from uh, from issues we had with the older one. Um, first thing is that the NATO architecture framework version four now is more shall be more usable for also businesses or enterprises outside the military context. Uh, um, major improvement is that the NATO architecture framework version four is much more compact and easier to apply. The old enough, so enough version three, you couldn't print it out. It was uh, several uh, thick books. And uh, the version four is now a, let me look it up, a 150 pages, including bibliography, um, thin book, just one. 
art is easier to understand, easy, you can really read it through. Um, it provides now a common approach and includes a own methodology. While in NAV version 3, we use the methodology uh, or we referred to the methodology of TOGAF. Um, now we have an own methodology, uh, which is but somehow derived from TOGAF. Uh, um, yeah, in the last year, there were many upcoming or new or meanwhile older standards, for example, triple, uh, the IEEE standards, uh, uh, 40, 42010, for example, 42020, and so on. And the new version has been aligned to all these standards, including the open group uh, standards and the OMG standards of architecture. Uh, and something also new is the adaption of existing meta models. So now the architecture framework version three had an own developed meta model based on UML and um, very powerful, very complex also and hard to maintain. And now we decided to adapt existing ones. <clears throat> Here, this is what you see when we are talking about the NIDO architecture framework version 4. This is somehow the core of the framework, the, the heart of it. Um, this grid layout of the viewpoints, uh, I think that most of you do know what a viewpoint or a view is. Uh, a, a view is an actual, um, <clears throat> that has, does have actual content and uh, the viewpoint is just the point where you're looking from and um, we have uh, in the NAV, we have now these grid layout. This is also new. This is not, might not be new to the most of you because uh, I think many of you do know the, uh, the Zechman framework from 1987 that already had such a grid um, layout. And, um, and here is, is something uh, quite uh, interesting for you, maybe outside the uh, defense context is that we have, for example, a line or a row, which talking about, intensively talking about capabilities. Uh, capabilities is somehow in the military planning or the military capability planning is somehow the highest level. Um, a viewpoint in NAVI 4 are represented as subjects of concern and aspects of concern. Um, I think uh, you also know that as perspectives and aspects. This is, um, the meaning is somehow the same. Um, just telling you about a bit of the content of the NATO architecture framework document. Um, by the way, the document is uh, developed and maintained very agile. That means we have uh, two, one or two, or maybe also three new versions in one year. That means when some issue comes up, we are very quick uh, with resolving this issue <clears throat> and to adapt to new challenges and so on. Um, okay, I won't now, will not take a, uh, talk uh, much about the introduction and the glossary. Um, the core is, uh, as I told you, these viewpoints. Uh, we are defining which uh, content is to um, depict or to capture in a diagram how. Uh, um, we have our methodology. Uh, it means in which step of the development of an architecture, or an architecture model, you are conducting which steps and uh, your actions. And um, of course, we are defining meta models. Uh, this is just in the framework, just a one pager, because we are fully referring to other existing meta models. Yeah, the meta model, this is an interesting thing at NEF. I also told you that we have adapted existing ones. Um, to be more exactly, we have two for the NADA architecture framework. In 2017, there was an assessment done um, and uh, the, we decided to take both Archimate and UAF. Okay, the question is why? Well, the thing is that the NATO nations have different needs in architecting. 
and uh, so different requirements to their uh, to the used meta models and uh, for example the united kingdom or the netherlands um, have specific needs which are at best covered with with archimate and uh, we in germany and in france for example also switzerland um, we have needs that are only covered with uaf because uaf is uh, uh, it is somehow a bit more difficult, it is more complex, but it also provides us a higher expressiveness. And so that is the reason because that uh, NAVI4 now has two possible meta models. Um, we also do provide um, modeling guidelines for these meta model adaptions. Uh, as you can read uh, yourself uh, the, for the UF domain meta model. Uh, this is our scope today, um, are already published and the uh, Archimate ones will be will come up shortly. Um, of course, um, you may ask, okay, different, different meta models, different models, different diagrams, uh, how can you exchange that? Of course, we are also working on a exchange mechanism. Okay, that was the last, first and the last slide where Archimate was mentioned because our focus here is uh, UAFs, Unified Architecture Framework from the OMG. Here you see the full UAF grid. We have also a grid. Uh, they have more than 60 viewpoints, more than 10 rows and 11 columns. Um, compared to the NAV V4, this is, as you see, a bit smaller. It has uh, 47 viewpoint, five rows and nine and nine columns. That means, and we are lucky that we can map NAFI4 viewpoints to UAF viewpoints. I can think we can do that to a 99%. As you see here, you see uh, some uh, names of, uh, or uh, numbers of NAFI4 viewpoints written in several uh, columns, for example, resource types in UAF are the P1 enough, or when talking about processes and operational things, we come to logical activities in UAF, which is the same as the L4 in the NAV. <clears throat> and so that leads to that what we have done now. Um, we, and well, just to repeat, um, we, this is uh, my office, uh, or me and my team and uh, Beard's office in Switzerland. Um, we have very good and strong and able uh, partners or contractors, such as this is, for example, BWI in Germany. This is the central IT provider of the Bundeswehr. And we have the RUAG in Switzerland um, who supported us with personnel and uh, very, very high expertise. Uh, we had also some review and support by Sparks and, of course, OMG. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, you have the question, why, when, just let me jump back, when we can map NAFI4 viewpoints to uh, UF viewpoints, why develop a specific profile for NAF and for Sparks? Um, well, the thing is, as I told you the expressiveness of UAF is significantly higher of as the one of the NAF. It is more, it offers more than we need than the names and content of the mappable viewpoints may be different between NAF and UAF. Uh, that means that we or the NATO ACAT architecture capability team decided that uh, the usage of UAF is based on a subset of the UAF's domain meta model. <clears throat> and this subset, subset should also be available to the modeler, should not be necessary for the modeler to just first do a mapping himself or select the relevant viewpoints from an existing UAF profile. Uh, we want to improve the usability, we want to reduce errors, and so on and make things a bit more easy. And another reason is also that uh, the NAF, as a uh, NAF, no, as a UAF based NAF profile this way, um, has some NAF specific, just a few extensions, which are just used in the NAF context. 
Um, and uh, why a profile for Spark CA? Well, this is a thing that we in Germany have Spark and also in Switzerland have Sparks at Sparks Enterprise Architect as our standard mandatory modeling tool. Yeah? That means we have a directive as written that we then doing architecture in projects uh, and, and capability development. We are doing this with a NATO architecture framework and we're doing this in Sparks. That's it. And Sparks is also very widespread and used in other NATO nations. That means uh, even if it's not the standard everywhere, many modelers or architects and other NATO nations or partner nations have the Sparks Enterprise Architect on their machine and they can hand out a Sparks made architecture to them. <clears throat> and as I already said, uh, the developed profile is a Sparks EA specific adaptation. That means um, everything in it is, it is just not a, a, a generic um, UML profile. It is really a Sparks pro based profile using all the features that Sparks offers for the use of profiles. Well, now come to the product. The product and the outcome of our efforts, uh, the center is the MDG. The MDG, which uh, is offered to all of you for free, if you want to try it, try it. Um, um, it is a dedicated, really separate, self-contained MDG for modeling UAF-based NAFI for models with Sparks Enterprise Architect. Uh, and uh, self-contained means that we have not only some structure of or structuring of the of the original NAFI for views you see here, uh, that you can directly select a NAFI for viewpoint which you want to model. Um, we also have um, examples included model patterns uh, where you can generate your examples yourself. We can. Uh, we did all. We also um, adapted Quick Linker. It's fully capable, and the toolboxes are also NAFI4 specific. Uh, we also did just to ease the application um, a pre-sorting of the toolboxes. That means uh, you have some uh, mandatory uh, elements which are usual in a as we have an example here in the MSC5, we have a separate a compartment for optional and so on. And this comes that you have in this MDG just enough V4 specific model elements, not more, uh, as if using the original UAF profile, uh, but also not less. But this is covering all the needs of NAV v4. The, uh, these NAV v4 profiles for Spark CA we developed um, are property of Germany and Switzerland. We will continue to maintain these uh, and we will also continue to maintain the so-called NAV core MDG. This is also provided to you. Um, because the core MDG is always, and develop further, the basis of our national extensions, uh, which is the uh, RDMBV, that means somehow uh, architecture data model of the Bundeswehr and uh, the ER mod in Switzerland. Yeah, if you're someone, someone can come back to these expressions, you know that these are just, this is enough. Uh, but just a national adaption or extension. <clears throat> um, as I already said, um, the profile um, profiles uh, are now finished the uh, NAFI4 core profile. That means this one here and the German version and the Swiss version is still in progress. Well, we also finished quite soon, I think. And these profiles will be uh, provided to everybody free of charge. Uh, you are allowed to, to use it. Um, there's some small policy to accept, um, but nothing big. 
And um, of course, uh, if someone of you there in the Sparks community says, okay, such a framework, another actual framework, that sounds interesting, I want somehow to contribute, um, then I can tell you, you are very welcome. <clears throat> um, I would now just jump back to the NAV v4 grip because it's still the center or the heart of the NAV, just to show it to you again. Bum, bum, bum. <clears throat> we have, I think, a couple of minutes next to the next uh, part of our presentation. And I want to show you again the grid and the, the main um, this is the other one. And uh, the main subjects we are working in the NAV. So this first set, the con concepts uh, and uh, services, IT services mainly. Uh, this is something everybody of you should know. IT services are like described in ITIL. Uh, we have logical. This is just somehow the um, operational part of the business layer. That means we are talking about uh, activities, about processes and logical data models and so on. And everything you can touch, and that's the reason why the name of that row is physical, everything you can touch like assets, like cars, like radios, like radars, uh, software, um, hardware, everything, servers are included in this row. And as I told you before in the slide with a business uh, resource alignment, of course, the framework does not only provide a horizontal traceability, it also provides a vertical traceability. And this allows us to really use that NAF, the NATO architecture framework as we need it. Okay, so I would say now I'm finished with my part of the presentation in a few seconds. So I will hand over to, to Bert. If you have any questions, just uh, write them to the host. And uh, later on, I will be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you very much, Christian. It was uh, great to hear from you. So I've uh, made uh, be out the presenter. So if you could uh, share your screen. And uh, there's just a couple of questions that have come through. So while I'm waiting for that to come up, uh, one of the questions was uh, the slides being made available. So hopefully I can uh, get uh, Christian and uh, be able to provide the slides and we can make these slides available on the Spark Systems website as well. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is Bert from Switzerland. I'm going to show you a, a scenario uh, which will show a number of viewpoints in the NEFV4 grid. So. The scenario is a civil scenario from Switzerland. Uh, we have, uh, in Switzerland, we have a REGA, which is the uh, leading civil operator for air ambulance and air rescue services. And um, this scenario was originally publicated in a, in a customer journal uh, from REGA. <clears throat> And they gave us uh, the kind permission to use uh, that scenario in our work as a, a demonstration example of uh, for NAFI4. I kindly invite you to read quickly through this um, scenario description, the text at the left of the slide. We are talking about repatriation, which means um, uh, to have uh, an injured uh, person 
flown back uh, from abroad to the to his home country by the uh, by this Rega ambulance jet. What you will see in the next few slides is a number of viewpoints illustrating this scenario. We have uh, we start with the logical viewpoints that the four viewpoints mentioned here. Uh, we will start with the L4, then go into the L1, L3, and the L7. And later on, we will see two service uh, viewpoints, namely the S1 and the S4. The rest of the uh, NFV4 viewpoints are not shown in this uh, scenario. Of course, they provide a lot of room for elaboration, be it in the direction of uh, capability planning or standard processes, uh, doctrinal processes, uh, capability taxonomy, capability planning, or be it in uh, the direction of resource planning. As mentioned uh, by Christian, this will provide the uh, appropriate vertical traceability. But again, uh, this scenario will focus on logical and service viewpoints. The first one is the L4. What do you see here? Basically, this is a BPMN collaboration diagram with a few number of UML specific additions. So it's in fact, it's a mix between BPMN notation and UML notation. The first thing is either the pools. Pools represent operational performers. In the version three of NEF, uh, they were called operational nodes. So we have in fact here four operational performance performance. We have uh, the passerby, we have the local ambulance, we have the local hospital, and we have the relatives of the uh, accident victim. Within, the, uh, within a pool, we have, of course, triggering events like this. And then we have a flow or a sequence of uh, the appropriate operational activities, such as alerting the ambulance, first aid, uh, then uh, recover and store the uh, motorcycle, and, and at last but not least, deliver food to the patient while he stays uh, at the hospital. As you know, not all hospitals provide food to their patients. Uh, a second uh, aspect uh, is um, the additional of roles that specifically allows us to express a kind of delegation. So while as uh, normally uh, operational performers, of course, uh, have appropriate roles in which they perform operational activity, it is possible to have uh, uh, a delegation of uh, a role which is normally assigned to someone else to a specific operational performer. In this example, uh, I would uh, focus on uh, the fact that this passerby in that, uh, in that actual scenario offers not only to provide first aid, uh, but also to recover the motorcycle after the accident, to bring it to his own home and to store it. Or uh, later, uh, when the uh, when the the accident victim is uh, is uh, safe and healthy, uh, uh, coming back and to to pick up his motorcycle, and as I said already, uh, he even delivers uh, food to the to the patient while he stays uh, in the local hospital. So in fact, what we see here is a kind of delegation of a role, which is breakdown service, which would be normally the part of another institution or another service. This is kind of delegated to this passerby who uh, 
takes over this role and this responsibility. Of course, in that scenario, this happens on a deliberate basis, not only on, 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 uh, in a commanded uh, way. So next to uh, operational activities, we have uh, the distinction between operational activities, which are uh, specific to the scenario and so-called standard operational activities. We see standard operational activities as activities that are defined by, uh, uh, for instance, uh, doctrine in operational context. And they do not need to be explained in great detail here because they are documented and specified in another place, in another document. Then the next uh, thing is um, message flows, as this one here. Here we use a, a little UML uh, aspect to document the, the information elements which are being carried by this message flow. As in, it, in that case, it, it is the alert message, the alert of the ambulance. Here we have other types of uh, information elements. The same is here. Message flows in VPMN, as you know, are the, uh, the, the preferred way of expressing inter-pool uh, interactions or cross-pool interactions. The next thing is, uh, is uh, the notion of a service or service specification. By the way, that has changed from NEF v3 to NEF v4. In NEF uh, v3, we were talking about service in F4, we are now talking about service specification. So this is an example of a service which can be consumed by a specific operational activity. In that case, it's alerting Riga. And for that, they provide an app for Android and, and uh, Apple iOS. Uh, this is a customer app and uh, it's, it's free. Uh, and everyone can use it to alert uh, Rega in a, in, a, in a case of uh, emergency uh, or to track uh, his position or to follow his uh, activities in the uh, outdoor. So this is the L4. What's not shown actually here is another way of representing um, uh, namely, using um, lanes to express uh, roles. As I said, in that case, we prefer to use a way of uh, expressing uh, delegation by explicit ex uh, assignment of roles, as in the, these examples here. In other scenarios, we would uh, divide the pools into a number of sub lanes uh, representing the roles in fact so this is an alternate way of representing that so this slide you will, uh, you know, you will find in the handout is, is, is a summary of uh, my my uh, explanation uh, of the diagram the next uh, viewpoint i would to present would like to present is the um, L4 in a hierarchical form. It's in fact a taxonomy of the um, operational activities involved in this scenario, uh, grouped by kind of type. We have medical activities, uh, this one here. We have medical transport activities, this one here, and we have C2, uh, command and control activities which include uh, alert, alert activities, planning and preparation activities, interactions with uh, different parties and so on. So this is in fact a taxonomy, which means a specialization hierarchy. This is pure UML. Here again, you have the uh, distinction between uh, operational activities which are specific to the scenario and standard operational activities.
again, this is the summary of what I explained so far. Next slide is the L1. So it's uh, a taxonomy of the uh, operational performers, also called as uh, um, node types in the, in the NAF grid. This is again a specialization and taxonomy of, uh, of um, operational performance and their types. So we have, uh, we have here, for instance, we have medical uh, facilities, uh, we have involved parties, and we have in that uh, specific scenario, we have our um, air ambulance operator in, in, in Switzerland. This is, as I said, it's the Rega. What we, um, what we also see are roles, assignment of roles to operational performers. So for instance, we have the hospital, we had, which has a role medic, which has a role nurse. We have um, diagnostics, uh, in fact, uh, imaging diagnostic, we have laboratory. Uh, we have, uh, as another example, we have the flight crew, which uh, has, uh, carries uh, the role commander, uh, co-pilot. We have the uh, flight nurse and we have the, uh, the flight medic. So this is uh, the L1, a taxonomy of the operational nodes or operational performers involved in the scenario. The explanation text. And the next viewpoint is the L3, which is called node interactions. This is again a pure UML notation. It shows you the uh, operational performers, such as the, the passerby, the ambulance, the hospital, relatives uh, of the victim. We have a Riga and we have uh, uh, the um, home uh, hospital in the home country. Between the operational nodes, you see uh, the information flows which were expressed as message flows in the uh, L4, and they carry the appropriate uh, information elements, such as the alert here, or kind of uh, transport uh, in, uh, document, uh, and a number of uh, information product, products which, which uh, go with the medical treatment and the release of the patient and so on, the transport of the patient and so on. What we typically uh, try to do is uh, to generate that uh, viewpoint out from the model information uh, which uh, is behind the, the L4. So we, we try not to draw multiple uh, viewpoints showing the same information, but to, to a model, uh, the, the leading one, which in that case is the L4, and then to derive or generate other viewpoints uh, out of the, the model information in the repository. That's how we would tend to, to do it. So to avoid uh, repetition of uh, manual tasks which are also error prone and time consuming. The next uh, viewpoint is the L7, which is the logical data model. Again, this is the UML. It's a collection of the information elements carried uh, by the node interactions or message flows shown on the L4 and the L3. Of course, this is not finished. Uh, this is just the starting point. It's, it's more uh, a kind of inventory of the information elements involved. And it's not, it's not a, a specification that, will, uh, that needs to be elaborated later on. So the, the uh, specification of each information elements 
some some of them might be defined by a standard which is pre-existing uh, while others needs to be specified individually for that uh, scenario of course we have the, the the elements and constructs which are, are being offered by the l7 um, profile um, uh, so entities and uh, relationships between between and attributes and so on so this is the l7 now we uh, come to the service viewpoints this one here is the S1, the service taxonomy. It's again, it's a specialization hierarchy of services or uh, in fact, service specifications. Uh, in this example, we have uh, repatriation services, which is in fact abstract, cannot be instantiated directly. Then we have a distinction between uh, consumer services and operator services. Uh, one specific type of consumer service is the Rega app, uh, already mentioned. And another um, uh, ex example of uh, operator service is um, what we identified as kind of flight plan uh, service, because as other any other air operator, also Rega, has um, has to um, provide flight plans uh, to uh, according to the international standards, and we as we we were assuming in that example that that they use they are using a appropriate service uh, which we called flight plan service. Last but not least, uh, we have the uh, LS4, which shows you the service functions being offered by the uh, service specifications. So for instance, the uh, Riga app, uh, according to its fact sheet, has, provides four functions. So it provides the alert function, it provides the possibility to share uh, one's position with uh, with friends, with other uh, interested parties, uh, for instance, while hiking or climbing, you can share your position. Uh, this provides your relatives to, to, in a way, monitor your activity and being uh, alerted when you do no longer move, for instance, and, and, and stay at the specific position uh, at the, uh, on, a, on a mountain, for instance, then they may, um, might be informed that you might have a problem. And of course, there is a testing uh, uh, feature in this uh, Riga app. The flight plan service, uh, we found in, uh, in, in some uh, documentation on the internet this of, uh, that obviously there are um, uh, they provide it, it provides functions to file navigational capabilities. It provides functions to file communication capabilities, and it provides function to file surveillance capabilities. So this is the S core service functions. And that uh, concludes my presentation of a number of uh, NEF v4 viewpoints uh, using this uh, specific scenario. So thanks, Pierre. Uh, it was a very uh, comprehensive presentation and uh, it was really great to see um, so many questions come through, but right now I'd just like to make uh, Peter Lieber the panelist. Just while Peter's getting ready, there are a couple of questions from a number of people saying, how can I get access to uh, the uh, NAF V4 MDG? And uh, so hopefully you might be able to address that. And I think you have on screen right now. So over to you, Peter. Yes, thank you. Since two minutes, it's available. <laughs> so it was really uh, 
funny guy, funny story. So it's since uh, two minutes available. If you use that link, www.sparksystems.eu slash NAF version four. And there you have a short registration screen because we want to know who is downloading it. Uh, and it is available right now. So you can, I have tried it uh, two minutes ago and it seems to work already. Um, if there is a challenge, please send over a short email uh, that we can uh, finalize any um, issues on that. So this is available for free that you use the MDG technologies, uh, currently the core and the German edition and hopefully soon also EA mod from the Switzerland uh, edition of NAF. So I hand over back to you, Scott, because that's the major story where to get. Um, I think this is um, a good finalization of this presentation. So Scott, it's your turn to give us some questions from the chat. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, greatly appreciated and uh... And uh, it's great to see uh, Enterprise Architect being used. So I have a, uh, a number of questions. So I'm just going to hand them over to the rest of the panel and I'll let people um, uh, jump in. Um, so the uh, first question is uh, from Michael and it says, does NATO have an interoperability framework? So is that built into NAF V4? I might need uh, my fellow panelists to unmute their mics and uh, respond. Okay. Christian, I think it would uh, be yours. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, yes. looking for the, for the button. Uh, <laughs> well, the NAF itself as an architecture framework is just a tool to provide uh, these efforts for interoperability. Um, um, asking for a um, <clears throat> interoperability framework, this is a just a small bit in my domain. Um, there are other tools, for example, the uh, <clears throat> NATO operability standards and profiles, that uh, the so-called NISP, which contains NATO-owned uh, or NATO-wide standards um, providing um, yeah some unique uh, some um, yeah some interoperability because uh, nations uh, have to implement these standards have to use these standards and that is the core of the yes you can call it somehow interoperability framework um, but enough itself it's not enough itself it's is a tool to achieve that Thank you. Uh, so uh, just to re-emphasize, Stuart said, is the MDG available now? And uh, so yes, it can be downloaded uh, uh, now. Um, uh, there's a question here um, asking about to what extent do different nations and partners uh, share models and uh, collaborate using uh, NAF v4? Could you could please repeat? I had a small lag. Uh, in yeah, the video. Uh, no problem. So it says, uh, to what extent do different nation states and private providers uh, share models um, based on NAF version 4? Or is it all independent? Um, do different countries just uh, maintain their own versions and rarely share models? Yep. Well, this is um, one of uh, this is another challenge. Um, the one the first challenge is that many nations come together and use the same framework, and uh, use this standardized standardized um, modeling languages. We have one NATO architecture framework. We have two meta models. So that means two kind of languages, and we have several different tools. Uh, and Spark CA is only one of many tools. For example, uh, the French use, for example, tools like Mega and so on. <clears throat> and um, 
the thing is it is it differs it is different um, from nation to nation um, at the moment there is not so much shared uh, architecture between nations regarding their national projects but there is a lot of architecture work or common architecture work in um, in uh, nato projects like for example the federated mission network uh, um, where we are talking about uh, completely inter interoperable um, standards for exchanging information and missions. Uh, and on, on this level, of course, the uh, exchange of uh, architectures or architecture models is high. On the other side, um, of course, uh, national project architecture models are offered to other nations. But this also depends on the classification of the models. Uh, many models can contain classified information. Uh, and so, okay, the short answer is it depends. <laughs> and uh, yes, um, that's a, and of uh, a course, very from Spark no Systems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and from Spark Systems uh, Central Europe point of view, or even Spark Systems Global point of view, is our motivation to multi -mot motivate everybody to use enterprise architect, of course. And that makes it easy if you have an access to this MDG technology. It's a low hanging fruit to start with NAF for, for version 4 modeling. And uh, it is a, was a huge effort from the Swiss and the German army to make it available in that way that they have provided. And it was also co great cooperation between Australia and, uh, and Austria in this case and Europe to make uh, things happen that uh, have not been there before. And I'm really proud to support this project. Yes, and it's fantastic to see all of those models being modeled in Enterprise Architect. And uh, there's lots of questions about, you know, support for BPMN and, uh, you know, um, TOGAF and UAF. And it's fantastic that Enterprise Architect supports modeling in all of these different disciplines and allows these standards to be supported. And Spark Systems has had a long history of supporting standards organizations all around the world and for helping out. Uh, so one example, Andreas has a question, how does NAF V4 meet the need of requirements management and requirements engineering? Um, and I know Enterprise Architect uh, can do that, but uh, perhaps someone would like to speak to that point. Well, if it comes to requirements management, um, um, the one who uh, placed that question um, should uh, be uh, quick with trying out the, the German extension because the German extension includes uh, requirement management viewpoints. Um, the thing is that in Germany or in the German military development or capability development projects, we are um, very, very um, requirement driven. The user gives us, the engineers, his requirements. And of course his processes about the the basic thing are the requirements and the requirements do somehow accompany the project until its end. And so that was the reason for us and also the reason for the Swiss guys to implement a separate row in the framework uh, uh, to care about requirements. Very good. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Don to uh, Beat about his example and says in your example um, does the repat service deal with customs and um, passport verification by government officers and um, I'm not sure if I got the, the, the question uh... Uh, no problems. It just says, um, in your example, maybe this is um, not of a specific concern, but does the repat service deal with customs and passport verification by government officers? No, I don't, don't think so. Not directly. Uh, of course, um, uh, uh, RECA is, uh, is, uh, is uh, a type of uh, air, uh, um, Air operator, and uh, while while uh, doing flight plans and the like, they have to care about uh, customs and passport uh, verification and so on. 
but this is not a, this is not an ex explicit um, part of um, this scenario here. It it cares that the the scenario is focusing on the on the the medical activities and and on the on the, the transport activities, uh, so to say. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there, um, a few people are dropping off the the line now. So I'm conscious of the time and I might wrap things up, but there are a number of questions that I might uh, give to the panelists to have a look at after this event. And we might be able to collate some answers to that. Uh, certainly there's a number of uh, technical questions about, um, you know, um, accessing things about TOGAF, uh, UAF, um, and uh, a mixture of different questions there and some of those might require a little bit more time so I'd really like to uh, uh, thank everybody for their expertise uh, Christian Biat for a, a excellent uh, presentation and Peter from Sparks Systems Central Europe uh, that can uh, provide assistance with uh, Enterprise Architect uh, if you need it and with the NAF profile and uh, uh, providing uh, the appropriate uh, training uh, if required as well. And uh, don't forget to visit sparksystems.com if you want to download a trial version of the uh, Enterprise Architect to try modelling for yourself. And uh, if you have any sales questions, uh, please reach out to us. So I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance. Uh, it's been great to have so many people online and such an engaged and active audience. I'd like to thank our presenters and uh, uh, have a, a great day, morning, evening or night, depending where you are in the world. And I think it's wonderful that uh, we've had people uh, online uh, from all parts of the world and presenters from Europe, Australia and uh, all different parts of the globe. So thank you very much and uh, take care, everybody.